Okay, so introduction. Um, John chapter 8, verse 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Um, I'm sure we've all heard this verse. I'm sure that we, or, uh, we've read of this verse. Maybe we've uh, probably heard sermons about this verse. Uh, or some of us maybe even have it hung on a, on a plaque on our, in our apartments or our homes. Or maybe it's on our screensaver, on our cell phone or tablet or whatever. It's a very popular verse. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32. That's worth memorizing. But you've got to look at the context, too. And we're going to do that today. But if this verse is true, okay, if this verse is really true, if the biblical truth is so powerful and so liberating, why is it that so many Christians continue to struggle? Right? It's a good question that we maybe don't ask, but we are all thinking, right? Um, many Christians still struggle with unhealthy habits and fears, uh, phobias, um, tormenting thoughts, um, what, else, what else? Guilt, other things too. So, you know, we believe that Christ is the answer, right? We have, even have a wonderful verse about that, or a wonderful song about that, and that is truth does make us free, okay? Yeah, I'm having trouble with my tablet already. Um, if we believe that he is the answer, why is it that so many of us are still struggling, okay? Why, have it, why are we still struggling with the same old issues that we had before we came to Christ? Like, aren't we new creations? Didn't, like, is it all things new? Well, yeah, it's true. Okay, so why is it? Okay, why is it? I'm going to push this button. And, oh, great, great. I was afraid it was going to blow up or something. Okay. So why is it that we are still struggling? And the answer is, is that we, we have struggled to apply spiritual foundations, or really a better word, spiritual truth, into our life. It's one thing to know the truth. It's another thing to get it into our lives, right? See, I believe that in order to experience the truth that sets us free, because I do believe the Bible, the truth sets us free, um, yet first we have to understand why the truth sets us free or makes us free, and we have to understand how the truth sets us free so that we can know the truth and then cooperate with the truth and then experience that truth that makes us free. So you have to understand how the truth works if you're going to be set free by it. You can't just know a verse and say, there, I've got that one. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I think I'll fly now. Right? No, you have to know how, why, and how the truth sets us free so that we can know it, cooperate with it, and let it experience, experience it in our lives so we can truly be free, okay? So, you see, in this 21st century, we have so much access to all sorts of digital uh, Bible study helps, right, and, and, and online courses. Actually, I'm working on developing an online school right now, uh, halfway through getting the website ready. And, 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 you know, and there's lots and lots of Christian teaching out there, everywhere, right? However, many of us still don't have <laughs> the healthy spiritual foundations that we need to be set free, or maybe it's that we have not formed the discipline necessary to apply those spiritual foundations, right? I got some great weight loss programs on my, you know, my computer, and I've got some get rich program, like everything, but, but if I don't apply it, nothing's going to happen, right? So many Christians, because of this frustration that they're not being free, they start looking for spiritual encounters, right? They're looking for spiritual encounters. And, and, and again, there's nothing wrong with looking for spiritual encounters, but they're looking for spiritual encounters in order to break off of their bondages and give them the freedom that they desire to give. And, and, and you know, I, I personally know so many wonderful Christians, and I really mean this, wonderful Christians, they love Jesus, they, uh, they seek to live their lives for Jesus Christ. However, because they've not experienced their freedom in Christ the way they thought they should experience it, they tend to run from deliverance minister to deliverance minister to deliverance minister. 
believing that the next meeting is going to be the meeting where they experience their spiritual breakthrough. And then finally, thank God, they're going to be completely free. The freedom that they desire and that they really need, they desperately need. Okay? And they even stand on the Bible, right? Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27, it shall be in that day his burden shall, be, shall turn away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck. And here's the point, the yoke shall be destroyed, the burden, right? The bondage will be destroyed because of the anointing, okay? The, the anointing breaks the yoke. It destroys the yoke, right? So we got a Bible verse for that. And, and, and so, and that verse is true. It's in the Bible, it's true. But as a result, people believe, well, if I just have one more spiritual encounter, if I just have one more spiritual encounter, encounter then the, uh, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is going to break off all of my bondages, and finally, I'm going to be free. Now, the problem with that thinking is that it's really not what the Bible teaches. And, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And, and really, that's not how deliverance works either, okay? I believe in deliverance. We minister deliverance, but that's not the way deliverance works. One more, break, one more encounter, and you're going to be free. See, yes, the anointing breaks every yoke, okay? The anointing breaks every yoke. It breaks the bondages. It breaks the chains. But it is the truth that makes you free. So just, just imagine with me for a minute, okay? Maybe I need to draw you some word pictures here. Uh, imagine with me that we are locked up in a dark prison cell uh, in the basement, the very bottom on far corner of some prison. Okay, we're down there. It's completely dark. We're locked up. We're in chains. The padlocks broke, or our padlock is there, and we can't get out. We're in bondage. We're in chains, right? And then someone comes along with a big hammer and a chisel and smashes that padlock, smashes the shackles. Okay? The anointing has been broken, right? The yoke's been, I'm sorry, the anointing has broken the yoke. Right? That, that, that chisel and hammer has smashed off the shackles. Okay, the lock. It's broken. But are we free? Okay. Well, the only broke the yoke. But are we free? No, because we're still sitting in darkness in the cell. And, and, and even though we know absolutely that the anointing has broken the yoke, we have no idea how to get out of the prison because we have no light to see how to get out of the prison. So what do we do? Well, we can stumble around the prison, groping from wall to wall and, and corner to corner for days or weeks, months, maybe even years, as most people tend to do. Or we can get our liberator to give us a flashlight and a map, <laughs> okay, on how to get out of the prison. See, even though the anointing of the hammer breaks the yoke, we need the truth of the instructions on the map in order to get out of prison and experience freedom. Okay? Yeah, see what I'm getting at? There, there, there's a process to freedom. Okay? So, um, so here, let me give you another example. Suppose we bought a new big, like really luxurious house, like a really nice big house, your dream house, okay? And you finally were able to buy that house, but unfortunately, the previous tenants, they left all of this garbage sitting inside the house, okay? And um, it started to attract what? It attracts a lot of flies. And so all day and all night, all these flies are buzzing around, uh, keeping us awake, tormenting us, and, and, you know, not to mention the smell of all the garbage, right? So what do we do? Well, we do what most people do. We go online and we do a detailed study about flies, right? And we learn all about the hierarchy of how flies function together and how they work together. And we learn the names of all the different kinds of flies. And then we, when we feel we have sufficient information on flies, we command those flies to leave. And some of them do. But then they come back with more flies. <laughs> so then we go online and we say, well, we need a professional. So we go online and find a, f a professional fumigator. And this fumigator is going to come. And we're going to hire them. They're going to come into our home. And they're going to drive out all the flies. And it works. They leave for a while. 
And then they, what do they do? They fly around, they come back with all their fly friends. And they bring back all sorts of new flies, even more powerful flies with them. And our home is even worse than before. What was the problem? Oh, the problem's not the flies. It's the garbage. Actually, there. We have to get rid of the garbage. We need a truth map so we can learn how to get rid of the garbage. You know, Jesus referred to this in uh, Matthew chapter 12. There it is. Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 to 45. When an evil spirit comes out of a man, a person, a human, and it goes, uh, it goes through and places, and, and places, yeah, it goes through and pl- or arid places, duh, okay. So, something wrong with this PowerPoint. It, go, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. So then it says, I will return to the house I left, and when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order, right? So it was put in order. And then it goes and it takes with it seven other flies, seven other spirits, more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there, and the final condition of that man is worse than the first, and this is how it will be with this wicked generation, because we have not embraced the truth into our lives. The flies keep coming back because we didn't deal with the real problem. The real problem is the garbage. The garbage. The anointed person. We hired the anointed person. He came in. He cast out those that spirit. But then seven more spirits came back with it. See, the tormented man did not embrace the truth and fill his life with the truth. And so the evil spirit came back with seven other spirits and made the man's torment even worse. Okay? So thank God for the anointing that breaks every yoke. It does. It breaks every yoke. But in order to experience freedom, we, 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 we don't just need to keep pursuing the anointing that breaks the yoke. We have to fill our lives with the truth because it's the f- truth that makes us free. Okay? Now, so we have to learn what the truth is and learn how to use it skillfully. Right? We need to learn how the truth works. Use it skillfully in order to get, why? To get rid of all the garbage out of our lives. And I, you know, I use the word garbage, but it could be brokenness, hurt, uh, trauma, unforgiveness, bitterness, rejection, abandonment, all these things. That's all garbage that just attracts flies. And, and so we got to get rid of all the garbage so it, it doesn't attract the flies anymore. Um, you know, th- that's why, you know, when we... Uh, I'm getting out of my line here, but I'll say this because otherwise I'll forget. Often when we minister deliverance, like real, you know, we cast out a spirit or broke, break a bondage of a spirit, never once has that spirit said to us, you don't have the authority to do that. They never say, do you know what they say? No, I have permission to stay here. Isn't that amazing? The spirits don't tell us we don't have authority because we already, they, they, they're smart enough to know we already know we have authority. But so they try a different tactic. It was, no, no. They got garbage in their lives. I have permission to stay here. See? And that's why we have to understand what the real issues are. Okay? So, the yoke has been broken. That's really good news. Um, and he, he, here, here, get this. If you are a Christian today, here's the wonderful news if you're a Christian today, a believer in Christ, please get this. The, the, the yoke has already been broken. It really has already been broken. Okay, On the cross, when Jesus died for our sins and rose again by the power of God, the anointing of the Holy Spirit broke the yoke. Really? Is that true? Well, Colossians chapter 2, 13 to 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all all our sins, having canceled, got that, canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it where? On the cross, right? To the cross. And having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross, okay? That word translate, or tra- that's the word disarmed, in the original language, it means to, to spoil, 
to put off, to strip off, to put away, or to cease to have any power. I think I even put that here, did I? No, I didn't. It's, it's in your notes, though. Okay. So, yeah, it's the anointing has broken the yoke. On the cross, the yoke has been destroyed. Okay? It's been broken. But our challenge now is to learn how to apply the truth in our lives, how to apply God's truth into our lives so that we can experience the freedom that was purchased on the cross. Okay? And then as we continue to apply the truth, and that is so important, we, as we continue to apply the truth, then we'll have increasing levels of freedom in our lives, in every part of our life, okay? Yeah, that's one of the reasons I love restoring the foundations ministry, okay? Um, because they recognize the yoke has already been broken. And so what they do is what we do in restoring the foundations ministry or free indeed restoration ministries that Mike and Sandy minister. They just take people through a number of guided sessions where they learn how to apply the truth to specific issues in their lives. And they get rid of the garbage by getting the truth in. And then at the end, the very final session, when they tell the flies to leave, the flies just go. Because there's no garbage left to keep the flies there. Now, and that's why restoring the foundations works so well. But here's, again, our misnomer, our, our mistake. We tend to call restoring the foundations a deliverance ministry. And it's really not. It's a truth ministry. But because we call it a deliverance ministry, people come expecting at the end of those five sessions, they will be completely delivered and there'll be no struggles anymore in their lives. And that's just not true. What we do during those five sessions is give you tools and principles of how to apply the truth in your life. And then after you continue to apply that truth in your life, those principles in your life, and then you will inc experience increasing freedom. And that's why Paul said, it's not in your notes, Paul said in Galatians chapter... I can't remember. He said, he said, it is for freedom that you have been that you have been set free. Past tense, you have been set free, but do not become enslaved again to a new yoke of bondage. See? So you get set free, but if you don't learn how to apply the truth in your life, a new more garbage will come in. Right? Somebody will sneak some garbage in while you're sleeping or whatever, and it'll be there in your house when you wake up. Where'd this garbage come from? Well, the relatives brought that garbage here. Or whatever. I don't. Anyway, <laughs> blame blame somebody. <laughs> or that TV program you're watching, maybe snuck in some garbage. Okay, because okay, because you have to learn how to com continue to apply the truth. Okay, so let's uh, quickly start our journey to freedom. Okay, how do we how do we start in our journey to freedom? Understanding the that that it, that the anointing breaks the yoke, but it is the truth that sets us free. And the real problem is not the flies, it's the garbage. How do we start this journey to freedom, okay? And we do it really by, in day one, and as I said, I, I, I think this is going to take a number of sessions, probably the whole spring when I'm not, when I'm preaching anyway. I know you're teaching in a few weeks, and William's teaching next Sunday, but whenever I'm teaching, um, how do we go through this journey? We go through this journey by making, I believe it's uh, five commitments that we have to make. In, in, if we really want to be set free, if we, you know, if, if you don't care about the flies, if you like, if you made good friends with the flies, right? If you're your pets, your buddies, then I can't, you know, like you're not going to listen to me. But if you really want all the flies to go, we need to make five commitments. Okay, so we're going to go back to John chapter eight, right? The truth will make you free, and see the context of what Jesus was saying. Okay, when he promised us freedom, context is everything. Okay, okay, so. Well, first, we have to commit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The very first verse, John chapter 8, verse 31, the verse before, it says, to the Jews who had believed him, the Jews who had believed Jesus. So all the promise of the truth making you free is for those who believe Jesus. And again, that, that word believe means to have faith in, to entrust one's life to, to commit to, to put your trust in. Okay, so we're not talking about those that just believe Jesus exists. Okay, Satan believes Jesus exists. Demons believe Jesus exists. Okay, the promise is free for freedom is for those who make a, a choice. Right, choice number one: commit yourself 
uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Put, commit our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Put our trust in him. Yes, accept him as Savior, but also accept him as the Lord or the leader of our lives, okay? We have to make that commitment. If you're not willing to make that commitment, get used to the flies. <laughs> really, get used to the flies. Number two, or B, commit to obey the truth, okay? The very next part of the verse We'll read again, John 8, 31 to 32. To the Jews who had, said, who had believed in him, right, commit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, then you're really my disciples. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Because you only really know what you've experienced, what you apply in your life. Anything you haven't applied in your life, you really don't know. You may think you know. You may have information about but until you've applied it in your life and experienced it, it's, you really don't know it, right? And so Jesus said, how do you get to know the truth that will make you free? You, you hold to his teaching. And again, what is that word? Hold means to stay in, to abide in, to dwell in, basically to obey, to make it a part of your life, okay? To know and obey the truth. So the, the problem or the promise of freedom is only for those who do their best Right? An honest, sincere decision to do your best to obey God's truth. The stuff you love and the stuff you don't love. Right? The stuff you like and the stuff you, you really don't want to obey. Right? Forgive that ornery neighbor next door. You gotta, right? Or the guy who keeps that neighbor that, whose cat keeps peeing on your lawn furniture. Gotta, gotta forgive that person too. <laughs> I wonder why that's in my head right now. Right? It's like, <laughs> okay. So, obey the truth. Third thing, we commit to complete honesty. This is a tough one, but you know, it's even the 12 steps, which was started by two Christian men, evangelical Christians, as a matter of fact, the 12 steps were. Um, John 8, verses 33 and 33, then the Jews answered him, we are Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. And, and how can you say that will be made free. And Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. Now here's the interesting thing. At that very moment that the Jews were saying, we've never been in bondage to anyone, they were living in bondage to the Romans. The Romans had taken over Israel. They were living in bondage. And somehow they forgot that they had also been in bondage to the Egyptians. They'd been in bondage to the Babylonians. They'd been in bondage to the Assyrians, right, during the, the dysphoria. Now they're in bondage to the Romans. And they said, we've never been in bondage to anyone. And Jesus, well, well, let's take this more personal then, guys. If you're not willing to admit your own history, let's make it more personal. If you continue to commit sin, if you keep committing a sin, you are a slave to that sin. So yes, you are in bondage. Whether you like to admit it or not, if you can't stop to do something, you're in bondage to it. You're a slave to it. So it doesn't matter if you're Abraham's servant or Abraham's uh, children. You know. um, just, just, it doesn't matter if you're born into a Christian home. It doesn't matter if, if you are a regular church attender. If you are habitually giving in to some sort of pressure or bondage, you, or, or, or whatever it is, influence, you are a slave to that thing. We have to be completely honest and admit admit, admit, yes, I have a problem, and it's not my spouse. I have a problem, and it's me. What's going on inside of me? So if we keep on sinning, we're a slave to sin, and if, we, if we're going to experience freedom, the freedom that makes us free, the, the truth that makes us free, we're going to have to be honest. We're going to have to commit to some honesty. Be willing to share you know, be honest to God, number one. But then be honest to one or two other people, too, that can help you start to work the truth into your life. Okay. Next thing. We have to commit to embrace our identity in Christ. This is kind of interesting here. I have never understood this verse until I've looking at, looked at it in context. Right after, you know, the truth will, shall make you free. John 8, verses 35, 36. And a slave, right? Jesus just said you're slaves to sin and a slave does not abide in the house forever but a son abides forever 
Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So what on earth is Jesus talking about here? Okay. The Jews were saying, hey, we are Abraham's descendants. We belong to Abraham's house. And Jesus said, no, you don't. You're living as a slave. You're living, so you're not really experiencing what it means to be part of the household of Abraham because you're living as a slave. And, and, and the, you know, the sons of Abraham were the sons of the freemen. So Jesus said, no, no, you're, you're, not, you're living as a slave. You're not living as a son. And so you're not experiencing all of the benefits of being a member of Abraham's house. And so what you need to do, Israelites, is embrace the son, right? Embrace the son so that you can truly be part of your father's house. And then you will be able to experience all the benefits of being of, of sonship of God and sonship of Abraham. Right? So you got to first embrace the son. Just because you think you're part of the house, so you're, you're safe forever. No, you're not, because you're living as a slave. So if we don't accept, the, so we have to accept the son and em, then embrace our identity in Christ as sons and daughters of God and then let that identity work in us. If we don't, we'll never experience the full benefits of sonship. It's not just, oh, I'm a child of God. I can even sing that song. I am a child of God. But no, no. Have you allowed it to work? Do you get a full revelation of what that means to be a child of God? If you don't, you're not going to be free. And that's why the fourth commitment is to commit to embrace your identity in Christ. Understand it. Read about it. Pray about it. You know, the things I'm going to start uh, to teach in the next few weeks especially, just really get them into your spirit. Otherwise, you will not be free. And then one final commitment we have to make is to commit to allow the truth to work in us. Allow the truth to work in us. Uh, John 8, verse 37, 38. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, meaning natural descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. You know it, but it has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you've seen with your father. Right? What is he saying there? What is Jesus saying? He's saying that although the Jews were natural descendants of Abraham, because the truth was not in them, right? The truth was not in the natural uh, descendants of Abraham. They were not allowing the truth to work in in them. They were not allowing the truth to work in them because it wasn't allowed to penetrate their lives. And because they weren't allowing the truth to work in them, they in fact were actually working against God and against God's will. And so in reality, they were living as children of the devil. Right? That's why Jesus said, you know, I speak what I've seen with my father, but you what you have seen with your father. So Jesus was saying that because his words has not been embraced by them, their thinking and their behaving were in line with the works of the devil, not the works of God. And Jesus made this even clearer in verse 34, John 8, 34. You are of your father, the devil. They go, no, no, Abraham. No, the devil, because there's no truth in you. So you're of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do because the truth is not in you so you're you're going after your father's desires rather than my desires he was a murderer from the beginning does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him okay so jesus was saying although that they claimed to be children of abraham because there was there is no truth in the devil and the truth was not in them either they were ending up thinking and desiring the same things that Satan wanted for their lives. And so they were living as children of the devil. Now, again, that's, to me, a scary thought. I'm not, I'm not pointing at anyone, right? My, my finger. I'm not pointing at anyone this afternoon. I'm just saying that why is it that sometimes we shake our heads and we go, why did I do that? Why did I do that? Like It's like... Like, I'm almost like, I'm acting like the devil today. What's going on in my life? Well, it's because in that area of your life, you did not allow the truth to penetrate and change your desires in your heart, attitudes towards God. And so in that area, you were 
enslaved to the enemy. You were a puppet to him. And, and if we don't allow the truth to work in us, eventually we'll embrace the thoughts and desires of the devil. We'll end up living like the devil and behaving more like the devil than like a child of God. Are you saved? Yes. Are you spirit-filled? Very well could be. But are you living as a son? Not if the truth's not in you. Because it's for freedom that you have been set free. And the truth will make you free, but first you have to make these five commitments. And so what we're going to do in this series going forward is we're going to learn about our identity in Christ. That is so foundational. I keep telling people all the time, do you, want, you need to know who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you. Those are the two foundational things. Uh, um, you have to, we have to understand, get a, a new revelation on the bigness of God but also the bigness of who we are as children of God. Okay? So in this series, we're going to learn about our identity in Christ, because until we truly understand our identity in Christ, we're going to continue to live in defeat. Okay? And then after we learn our identity in Christ, we're also going to learn about the battle that every Christian must overcome in our life. Because if we don't understand the battle, we will, you know, if you don't understand that someone's attacking you, they'll end up winning. You've got to know they're, they're attacking you, right? You've got to know they're, they're coming after you so that you can properly defend yourself with the truth, okay? So we have to know who we are in Christ. We have to know that there is a battle going on, what the battle looks like, how to overcome the battle. Then we have to understand the resources that we have in Christ so that we can overcome the enemy and the battle that we're in. And then we have to learn how to tr apply the truth every step of the way, okay? And we're going to discover, again, some good news, bad news. We're going to discover that the degree of truth that we embrace into our lives will determine the degree of freedom that we will experience in our lives. It, it just, it'd be nice if that wasn't true. It'd be nice if we were free in one area, we'd be free in every area. But, you know, man, I know some incredible ministers that are so free in certain areas of their life. In other areas, they're in complete bondage. It's not because they're not born again, spirit-filled lovers of God. It's because they haven't allowed the truth to penetrate certain areas of their lives. You know, and, and, and again, please understand, I'm, I'm right there with you in this process. I want to get free in every area of my life. Because I, I get negative now and then. My, my wife would probably say most of the time. I don't know. But, you know, I just, you start thinking negative thoughts, and suddenly they just squirt out of your mouth. And you go, where did that come from? Well, it came from within, out of your mouth, so it must have been inside of you up there. Must have been up there at one point for it to come out your mouth. And the problem is that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So it will, it will have totally control our lives, right? So I'll say it again. To the degree of truth that we embrace into our lives, to that degree will determine the freedom that we'll experience in our lives. And so together we're going to learn this spring how to be completely free if you will continue, if you'll make these five choices and then continue to walk in them. Okay, so what are the five commitments again if we're on this journey to freedom? Commit to the Lordship of Christ. It's, it's great that he's your friend, but make him your Lord. Okay. I once worked with a guy in a, in a ministry. He was my friend, a really good friend, but he was also my boss. And, and some days I could appeal to him on the basis of friendship, and other days I had to submit to him on the basis that he's my Lord, he's my boss. And we have to make that distinction if we come to Christ. Some days it's so nice to have him walking side by side with us and tell him, telling us how much he loves us. And other days, you know, he's just going to say, Dave, grow up. Uh, fill in your name just, just just so you're not all praying for me to grow up right just <laughs> fill in your name okay fill in your name okay um, <laughs> and, and some days my friend had to come after me and discipline me because I w went too far in my 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 supposed freedom in in, in my job and, and he, he was he was my boss first and we need to remember that Jesus is our Lord first okay Commit to the Lordship of Christ. Commit to obey the truth. The truth of what's in his word and the truth of what he speaks to us. Because there are certain things that are not in his word, right? Like, yes, it's, his word says uh, forgive, but his word doesn't say forgive this person at this time because they did this to you, right? So we have to listen to his, his, his written word and his spoken word. Then we have to commit to complete honesty. See, that's what uh, confession is really all about. 
Confession doesn't mean to feel bad about something. It really doesn't. Confession doesn't mean to have all these negative feelings, to feel sorry, to feel, uh, to commiserate that you've done something wrong. The word confess and confession literally means just to agree with. That's all it means. Confession means to agree with. And that's why our faith is called the confession. The confession of our faith means to declare what we believe about the Bible. That's the confession of our faith, right? It's not about feeling bad. It's about agreeing with the word of God. And so when the Holy Spirit says, well, that was a lousy attitude, your first response is to say, that, that woman that you gave me, <laughs> like Adam did, right? He, he, it's, it's not about blaming. That's not confession. Confession says you're right. It, God, if you said it's a lousy attitude, it's a lousy attitude. If you said I was out of line, I'm out of line. And if God just happens to use your spouse or your child or, or whatever to say that or your friend or your neighbor, then you, you still agree. Even though it was coming from a source you didn't want to come through, if it's the word of the Lord, it's the word of the Lord. Yeah, and confession means, yeah, you're right. You're right. I was wrong. That attitude was wrong. That behavior was wrong. That, that self-justification was wrong. Um, whatever. That motive was wrong. If, if, Lord, if you said it's wrong, it's wrong whether I think it's wrong or not. And God will eventually show, if you agree with it, God will ve- he'll show you where it's wrong. Okay? So, complete honesty. Obey the truth. Complete honesty. Commit to embrace our identity Christ. It's a journey, folks. Don't just say, hallelujah, I'm now a Christian. I've committed to the Lordship of Christ. If you don't know your identity in Christ, you will still live as an orphan. You will live lost. And then commit to allow the truth to start to work in you. And as you start to work in you, as you let the word of God work in you, then you start to experience some levels of freedom all five together. You can't just choose four to five, right? You can't just check off, well, I kind of like the uh, identity in Christ one. That's a good one. I love that one. But no, let the, be honest. That's one you got to embrace too and, and let the truth work in you. Okay, so all five. If we embrace all five, we'll start the process to freedom. And, and unfortunately, it's going to be two weeks before I'm up, three weeks before I'm on again. But when I am, I'll go to the next three sessions. We'll be on really getting our identity in Christ sorted out because that's so foundational, okay? So what do we do today? Well, let's make the five commitments. And let's then choose every day to recommit to make the five commitments, okay? It's not a one-time deal. So let's go back to the five commitments. Let's do this together right now. Father, in Jesus' name, we commit to your lordship. We commit right now on January the 8th of 2023, online and in person, we commit to your Lordship. This year, you're not going to be bud. You're not going to be friend. You're going to be king of kings and lord of lords. You're going to be the lord of my life. This year, I lift you up as king of my life, as lord of my life, and I commit to allow you to be my lord. Lord, I also pray you would help us to obey your truth. Whenever you speak to us, whenever you show us something from your word, whenever you whisper in our ear, whenever you use someone we love or someone we don't love to show us something in our lives, Lord, we'll obey the truth that you show us and we'll be completely honest. God, we're not going to be honest to our enemies. God, that's just not smart. But we're going to be honest to you and we're going to be honest to a couple other people in the body of Christ. Lord, help us to make that commitment to complete honesty so you can really start the work in our lives. And Lord, we commit to embrace our identity in Christ, God. It won't just be some nice words. It won't be just some nice declarations. We will start to live as your children. We will start to live as sons and daughters. We will start to live uh, and understand our inheritance and our authority and our power and our, and our responsibility in you. We will commit to embrace our identity in Christ. And we will finally commit to allow the truth to work in us. Lord, that's a scary thing because sometimes we've been holding on to stuff in our lives to keep our lives together. And, and God, we were just afraid if we let go, we might fall apart. But Lord, fortunately, number four is we are your children and you love us completely. You love us deeply and you're not going to let us fall apart. You're going to be right there with us, helping us as we commit to your truth and let it work in our lives. You're going to be right there with us, helping us through the process. So Lord, right now, on January 
8th of 2023, Lord, we make these five commitments to you. And we will be our best to honor them. And when we start to slip or fall short, Lord, we will cry out to you and you will come and strengthen us and help us to obey these five commitments. Because, Lord, this is the foundation of our freedom. And we want to be free. We want to obey the truth, know the truth, and then the truth makes us free. It works in us and it makes us free. Thank you, God, for the work you're going to do in our lives this year as we say yes to you each day of our life. We pray this in Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen.